13 defense programs and policy, along with a number of judicial nominations. Now to live coverage of the U.S. Senate here on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order. The Senate Chaplain, Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, you only are immortal. So today we offer our thanksgiving. Thank you for life and for opportunities to make our nation stronger. Thank you for the peace you give, even in the midst of storms. Use our senators today, filling them with strength and purpose. May they labor to encourage the right and correct the wrong. When they meet with reversal and failure, may they not become weary, but continue to work to fulfill your will. We pray in your sacred name. Amen. Please join me in reciting allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., December 21st, 2012 to the Senate under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Sheldon Whitehouse, a Senator from the State of Rhode Island, to perform the duties of the Chair, signed Patrick J. Leahy, President Pro Tempore. Mr. President. Senator from North Carolina. Following leader remarks, the Senate will begin consideration of the conference report to accompany H.R. 4310, the National Defense Authorization Act. The filing deadline for second-degree amendments to the emergency supplemental bill is 1.30 p.m. today. At approximately 2 p.m., there will be a roll call vote on adoption of the National Defense, National Defense Conference report. We will work on an agreement for amendments in order to complete action on the supplemental as well as an agreement on FISA. The Majority Leader. Last night, the House of Representatives approved what we've known for quite a while. Speaker Boehner's plan to raise taxes on 25 million middle class taxpayers while handing out about $50,000 bonuses to millionaires and billionaires was dead on arrival. We said that yesterday. We knew the so called Plan B was no plan at all. It couldn't pass the Senate. Turns out it couldn't pass the House either. It's too bad Speaker Boehner wasted a week in this futile political stunt, and that's all we can call it, Mr. President. But at least now House Republicans have gotten the message loud and clear that comprehensive, a comprehensive solution to the looming fiscal cliff will need to be a bipartisan solution. No comprehensive agreement can pass either chamber without both Democrats 
and Republican votes, which means any solution will have to ask the most fortunate among us to pay a little more to reduce the deficit and ensure partisanship doesn't take the nation to the brink of default. Nothing that has passed the House of Representatives fits that test. Nothing. A few days ago, President Obama and Speaker Boehner appeared poised to strike a grand bargain. But we've heard that before. Instead of making hard choices of compromising, as President Obama has been willing to do, Speaker Boehner, I'm sorry, the Speaker retreated, I'm sorry, retreated to his corner and resorted to political stunts. But that stunt fell flat. It's time for the Speaker and all Republicans to return to the negotiating table. We've never left, Mr. President. It's time for Republicans to work with us to find the middle ground. That's the only hope of averting the devastating impacts of fiscal cliff. Mr. President, the fiscal cliff is, needs to be avoided. And in the meantime, the Speaker should bring the middle class tax cut passed by the Senate five months ago to the floor of the House for a vote. We know it would pass. All he has to do is let Democrats vote with some Republicans. It'll pass. The clock is ticking until the nation goes over the fiscal cliff and tax vote for every family in America. But there's still time for the Speaker to hit the brakes and avoid that cliff. We don't need the Thelma and Louise projection over that cliff, Mr. President. The Senate passed bill would protect 98% of families and 97% of small businesses from crippling tax hikes while President Obama and the Speaker work toward a compromise agreement. Uh, and that agreement should be comprehensive. If Republicans truly want to ensure American families' taxes don't go up on January 1st, they should simply pass the Senate bill. The only reason Speaker Boehner hasn't brought our bill to the floor sooner is that he knows it will pass. He worked for a day or two seeing if he could bring that up so it wouldn't pass. That didn't work either. Americans are not fooled by the Speaker's phony procedural excuses for failing to bring this solution to a vote. They're tired of excuses. They expect action. So let me be very plain. There's nothing preventing the Speaker from taking up our bill and giving middle class families certainty. So I say to my friend, the Speaker, this isn't a game. It isn't about scoring political points or putting wins on the board. There will be very serious consequences for millions of families if Congress fails to compromise. There will be very serious consequences for our country if Congress fails to compromise. It's time for the Speaker to return to the negotiating table ready to compromise. It's time for the House, especially the House Republicans, to remember what's at stake. I repeat, the $250,000 program would pass overwhelmingly in the House. It's up to the Speaker to let that vote occur. The Republican leader. Most people, of course, are focused today on what happened last night over in the House. I'd like to focus on a press conference that congressional Democrats held just a few hours earlier. Here were the leaders of the Democratic Party here in the Senate, other than the President. These are the folks with the greatest responsibility for protecting the American people from a massive tax hike coming in January. And what did they do? They stood in front of the cameras and laughed laughed. They giggled at a bunch of bad jokes and told the American people they didn't plan to do anything this week. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Democrats in the House vowed they wouldn't vote for this bill. The majority leader vowed he'd ignore it if it made it out of the House and landed in the Senate. And the President vowed he'd veto it if it made it out of the Senate. So Democrats spent all day yesterday literally all day yesterday, defeating a bill that would have made current tax rates permanent for more than 99% of Americans, and they laughed about it. Ten days to go until the fiscal cliff, and they laughed about it. Now, I don't know if anybody's looked at a calendar lately, but we're about out of time here, folks. This isn't funny. People's livelihoods are at stake here. The U.S. economy is at stake here. Millions upon millions of families are counting on us to do something. 
look, it's the president's job, it's his job to find a solution that can pass the Congress. He's the only one who can do it. This isn't John Boehner's problem to solve. He's done his part. He's bent over backwards. Mr. President, how about rallying your party around a solution? How about getting Democrats to support something? I've said it many times before, we simply cannot solve the problems we face unless and until the President of the United States either finds the will or develops the ability, the ability to lead. This is a moment that calls for presidential leadership. That's the way out of this. It's that simple. Does anybody wonder why we keep going from crisis to crisis around here? Anybody notice a pattern? This didn't have to be a crisis. This was an opportunity. But once again, the president ignored it. He went out and held rallies and gave partisan speeches even after he'd already been reelected. As I said yesterday, I think it's obvious at this point the president wants to go off the cliff. But I know most of the American people don't want that. So today I'm going to make an offer. With 10 days to go, we have an obligation to act on something, something that can pass the House and the Senate. And if the President won't propose it, if Senate Democrats won't propose it, I will. Earlier this year, the House passed a bill that extends current rates on everyone for one year, one year, with instructions for expedited comprehensive tax reform by next year we could bring up this House passed bill. If the majority leader has a plan that can get 60 votes in the Senate, break through the disarray in his own caucus, and build bipartisan support, offer that as an amendment, and then let's vote. Let's vote on amendments from all sides. And then let's go to conference with the House of Representatives. They've already passed a bill, one that I support, to prevent a tax hike on all Americans and reform the tax code, why don't we take it up here and let's get this done. It's called legislating. That's what we used to do in Congress. Now, Democrats may be popping champagne corks today about bringing down Plan B, but all their effort to do so yesterday won't protect a single taxpayer from a massive tax hike in just a few weeks. The American people are waiting. Surely we can do better than this. Let's do it. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Under the leadership time is reserved. The majority leader. Mr. President, if this weren't such a serious situation we face ourselves, it would be laughable. Can you imagine saying that we should defeat a bill? that we've already defeated. We voted. We voted on the proposal the same time we voted to pass that protecting middle class Americans. That passed the Senate. One, to give the richest of the rich a tax continuation of the breaks they get. As I indicated, the proposal they had about another $50,000 for each of them was defeated here. It was defeated in the Senate. <clears throat> so. My friend, and he is my friend, the Republican leader, is struggling to find a way to blame Democrats. And it's a struggle. Trying to blame us for the failure of the House to pass the Speaker's bill. <clears throat> the House is led by the Republicans. Their margin narrowed will be better for the country after the first year. <clears throat> but right now, he controls the House by a wide margin. <clears throat> I served in the House. The Speaker is all-powerful in the House. To blame us for that travesty that took place over there, Mr. President, that is pretty incredible. As I tried to say in my remarks here, Mr. President, couldn't we at least protect the middle class? My friend complains that the president hasn't done enough. He put forward a proposal that has received criticism from Democrats because he was too generous with Speaker Boehner. But the president believes, as he said several times, 
both sides may have to make hard choices. The President released a balanced $2.4 trillion program. It's pretty good. It would alleviate the fiscal cliff. It would allow the SGR to continue so doctors get paid and patients have a doctor to go to. It extended unemployment benefits for people who are desperate. It's true there's a crisis here, but it's because the House Republicans refused to pass the Senate passed tax bill. It's because the Republicans in the House are fighting among themselves. The Republican leader seeks to pass a House passed bill, but we've already turned that bill down. The real answer lies in the Speaker who controls the House of Representatives, talking to the President, and working things out. Briefly, the Republican all, leader. All I was suggesting to my friend, the majority leader, is you have a tax bill that originated in the House. It came over to the Senate. If our friends in the majority don't like that version of it, they could call it up, amend it, and see if there's a majority in the Senate for something. Um, the time for finger pointing is, seems to me, about over. <laughs> American people are not particularly interested in what originated here or there. Or who's doing what, they're, they're interested in getting a result. And I was just trying to be helpful in suggesting you've got a tax bill that came over from the House, you've got a majority here, you could take it up, offer amendments, see if there's something that can achieve a majority uh, of the Senate um, rather than just complaining because the House didn't pass something yesterday. That isn't going to solve the problem. Somehow, some way, we need to find a way forward here, and I hope we can in the coming week. Mr. President, I, Leader. I hope we can too. But this is really quite remarkable. <clears throat> I'm told that members from this body went and talked to the Republican caucus yesterday saying, send us your plan B, and the Democrats over here will take care of it and send you back something that you'll like better. Mr. President, you can re we can all see what's happened in the press. Now, I like John Boehner, but gee whiz. I mean, this is a pretty big political battering he's taken. What he should do is allow a vote in the House of Representatives on a bipartisan bill. It will pass. Democrats will vote for it. Some Republicans will vote for it. That's what we're supposed to do. But he's trying to pass everything with that majority that he has that can't agree on anything among themselves. Bring in the Democrats. That's what the country was set up. Our founding fathers set it up that way. But he wants some other method where everything is done by a slim majority that they have. This is absolutely incredible, Mr. President, and we believe that the Speaker should be concerned. I'm confident he is, but maybe he's more concerned, as some have said, about his election to be returned as Speaker. He should be more concerned about what's going to happen to the country. If he showed leadership and walked out there and said, this is the right thing for the country, we're all going to vote on this, Democrats would vote for it, and enough Republicans vote for it to pass something that would take us away from that fiscal cliff. But this uh, brinksmanship and this silliness that's going on over there that you wouldn't do an eighth grade government election. President, the Republican I would only add that time for finger pointing is uh, gradually running out here. The American people know we have a president, they know we have a Senate, and they know we have a House. And they're actually waiting whether we're going to solve this problem before the end of the year. <clears throat> Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of the conference report to accompany H.R. 4310, which the clerk will now report. Conference report to accompany H.R. 4310, 
the Committee of Conference on the disagreeing votes of the two houses of the, on the amendment of the Senate to the bill H.R. 4310 to authorize appropriations for fiscal year 2013 for military activities of the Department of Defense and so forth and for other purposes, having met, have agreed that the House recede from its disagreement to the amendment of the Senate and agree to the same with an amendment and the Senate agree to the same, signed by a majority of the conferees on the part of both houses. Under the previous order, there will now be up to one hour of debate equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees prior to a vote on adoption of the conference report. The Senator from Michigan. Mr. President, on behalf of the Senate Armed Services Committee, I'm pleased to bring along with Senator McCain the conference report on H.R. 4310, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2013. This conference report, which was signed by all, sen all 26 Senate conferees, all the members of the Senate Armed Services Committee, contains many provisions that are of critical importance to our troops. This will be the 51st consecutive year in which a National Defense Authorization Act will be enacted into law. I want to thank my dear friend Senator McCain, our ranking minority member, for all that he did to bring us to this conclusion and for the years of great leadership on our committee. I've been lucky to have Senator McCain as a partner. I know both of us are grateful to the chairman and the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee Buck McKeon and Adam Smith for their hard work on reconciling the many differences between the House and Senate bill and uh, for helping to produce a solid bill to support the men and women of our armed forces. Mr. President, the conference report uh, contains many important provisions that will improve the quality of life for our men and women in uniform. It will provide needed support and assistance to our troops who are deployed it will make the investments we need to meet the challenges of the 21st century. First and foremost, the bill authorizes a 1.7 percent across the board pay raise for all members of the uniformed services consistent with the President's request. The conference report contains strong additional sanctions on Iran. The Iran sanctions provisions will designate certain per uh, persons in Iran's energy, port, shipping and shipbuilding sectors as entities of proliferation concern subjecting many more transactions with such entities to sanctions. It will impose sanctions on persons selling or supplying or diverting to Iran a defined list of materials relevant to the aforementioned sectors to certain Iranian specially designated nationals or blocked persons or to be used in connection with certain Iranian military programs. It's going to impose sanctions on any insurance or reinsurance provider or underwriter that knowingly provides underwriting service, insurance or reinsurance for activities for which sanctions have been imposed to any person in the energy, shipping or shipbuilding sector in Iran. It will designate the Islamic Republic of Iran Broadcasting and its president as human rights abusers for their broadcasting of forced confessions and show trials, blocking their assets and preventing other entities from doing business with them and banning any travel to the United States. The administration requested three modifications in particular. One was additional time to implement the provision following enactment. Second was additional time between waiver renewals. And third was a modification of the exceptions clause from non-designated Iranian financial institutions in the Senate passed version to a broader term that would have incorporated non-designated Iranian persons. The conference report provides two of the three modifications, the additional time requested. It does not uh, make any change in terms of the exceptions clause. The conference report contains uh, a few provisions addressing detainee issues. These provisions extend existing limitations on the transfer or release of Gitmo detainees for another year. We did not adopt the permanent limitations in the House bill. We also provided new flexibility for dealing with detainees who cooperate with U.S. intelligence and law enforcement authorities pursuant to pretrial agreements. The report establishes new congressional notification requirements for military detainees held on naval vessels and for third country nationals 
who are released from military detention in Afghanistan, but the report does not place any conditions or limitations on such transfer. The conference report includes, excuse me, the conference report does not include the Senate language regarding military detention inside the United States. The House conferees would simply not accept this provision. Instead, we included a provision which says and states the following, quote, nothing in the authorization for use of military force, public law such and such, or the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2012 shall be construed to deny the availability of the writ of habeas corpus or to deny any constitutional rights in a court ordained or established by or under Article III of the Constitution to any person inside the United States who would be entitled to the availability of such writ or such rights in the absence of such laws. Now the provision in the fiscal 2012 act which is referred to in the language I just read and is already law, that section in the 2012 Act is Section 1021. That section said the following, quote, nothing in this section shall be construed to affect existing law or authorities relating to the detention of United States citizens, lawful resident aliens of the United States, or any other persons who are captured or arrested inside the United States, close quote. Now the language in this conference report that we're presenting today reflects my view that Congress did not restrict or deny anyone's constitutional rights in either the 2001 authorization for use of military force or the fiscal year 2012 National Defense Authorization Act. As a matter of fact, the statement of managers accompanying this conference report points out that, quote, constitutional rights may not be restricted or denied by statute. Now, on the alternative fuel provision, the conference report does not include a provision in the House passed bill that would have prohibited fiscal year 2013 for the production or purchase of alternative fuel if the cost of producing or purchasing the alternative fuel exceeds the cost of traditional fossil fuel. The conference report does contain a provision that limits the Department of Defense's fiscal year 2013 Defense Production Act funding for the construction of a biofuel refinery until, and that's the key word, the Department of Defense receives the promised contributions from the Departments of Energy and Agriculture for the same purpose. We do not limit phase one of the DPA, the Defense Production Act project, nor does the conference report limit the FY12 funds for construction. The conference report on, in the area of cyber, the conference report requires that a part, the Secretary of Defense to create a process requiring the defense contractors that use or possess classified or sensitive Department of Defense information to report successful cyber penetrations of their networks or information systems. Additionally, if the department is concerned about a particular event and feels the need to determine what Department of Defense information may have been lost from such penetration, the provision would authorize the Department of Defense to conduct its own forensic analysis upon request and subject to the specified limitations. <coughs> I know the presiding officer has a special interest in this area of cyber security. This provision in the defense authorization bill <coughs> represents a major breakthrough in the nation's need to protect cyber, our, our information systems and cyber security. Now there's a lot of other sensitive areas where we're threatened with cyber attacks, such as financial, police, transportation sectors, which obviously we could not touch. They're not within our jurisdiction, but they need similar action. On the area of missile defense, the conference report provides the Secretary of Defense will evaluate by the end of 2013 at least three possible future missile defense interceptor deployment locations in the United States, at least two of which would be on the East Coast 
and then to prepare an environmental impact statement for the locations evaluated. It would also require the Director of Missile Defense Agency to protect a contingency plan for deployment of an additional interceptor site in case the President decides to proceed with such a deployment. However, the conference report does not mandate, nor does it authorize, the deployment of any missile defense site and does not require the Defense Department to submit a deployment plan to the Congress. There's many other issues that I would touch upon, Mr. President, but in the interest of time, I would just uh, summarize my statement as follows and would ask unanimous consent that the balance of my statement, which I have not read, be inserted in the record as though read. Without objection. Mr. President, I once again want to thank Senator McCain. As I said before, I've been honored, I've been pleased, and I've been lucky to have Senator McCain is my partner in leading the Armed Services Committee. And I know how indebted we both are to our staffs as well as to all of our members who work so well together on a bipartisan basis. Our majority and minority staffs, led by Rick DeBovis and Ann Sauer, have done amazing work on this bill. They did months' work in weeks. They did weeks' work in days. And they did days' work in hours. I ask unanimous consent that the full list of our majority and minority staff who gave so much of themselves and of their families be printed in the record at this time. Mm -hmm. Finally, I would, I would note that the committee's chief clerk, Chris Cowart, will be retiring at the end of this year after completing more than 41 years on the committee staff. She has been a driving force behind the staff's support for the Annual Defense Authorization Act, and she will be sorely missed. And I yield the floor. The Senator from Arizona. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that Lieutenant Commander Todd Loudwig and Victor Glover, Navy Fellows in my office, be allowed four privileges for the duration of the debate on the conference report, H.R. 4310, National Defense Authorization Act of fiscal year 2013. Without objection. Mr. President, I note the presence of the Senator from Kentucky on the floor. I understand he seeks recognition for how long? For 10 minutes, and I ask that he be recognized at this time. Mr. President. The Senator from Kentucky. I rise in opposition to this bill because I believe it contains language that would allow American citizens to be detained without trial. Now, the other side has argued that that isn't true, that you will be eligible for your constitutional rights if you get into an Article III court or a constitutional court. But here's the rub. You have to be eligible. Who decides whether you're eligible for the court or not? It's an arbitrary decision. And this is what this debate has been over. So don't let the wool be pulled over your eyes to think that you have a protection and that you will get a trial by jury if accused of a crime. We had protection in this bill. We passed an amendment that specifically said if you're an American citizen or here legally in the country, you would get a trial by jury. It was explicitly stated and it's been removed in the conference committee. It's been removed because they want the ability to hold American citizens without trial in our country. This is so fundamentally wrong and goes against everything we stand for as a country that it can't go unnoticed and should be pointed out. Now, proponents of indefinite detention without trial say that an accusation alone is sufficient, that these crimes are so heinous the trials are unnecessary. They will show you pictures of foreigners in foreign dress from foreign lands and say that that's what this debate is about. It is untrue. This debate is about American citizens accused of crimes in the United States. Make no mistake that the faces of terrorism include awful people who should be punished to the full extent of the law. But the same portrait of evil could be drawn of domestic terrorists 
of domestic terror and domestic violence. One could parade pictures of Charles Manson, of Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma bomber, of Jeffrey Dahmer, and people would cry out that they don't deserve a trial either. But when we think about it, when most Americans understand at some level that when you're accused of a crime in our country, you get a trial. You get a trial by a jury of your peers. No matter how heinous your crime is, no matter how awful you are, we give you a trial. This bill takes away that right and says that if someone thinks you're dangerous, we'll, we'll hold you without a trial. It's an abomination. It should not stand. Most Americans understand that you are accused of a crime doesn't make you guilty of a crime. You get your day in court. Now some here may not care when they determine that they're going to detain Ahmed or Yusuf or Ibrahim, but many Americans and innocents are named Ahmed and Yusuf and Ibrahim. Many Americans are named Saul or David or Isaac. Is our memory so short that we don't understand the danger of allowing detention without trial? Is our memory so short that we don't understand the havoc that bias and bigotry can do when unrestrained by law? Your trial by jury is your last defense against tyranny, your last defense against oppression. We have locked up Arabs, we have locked up Jews, we have locked up the Japanese. Do you not want to retain your right to trial by jury? Do you want to allow the whims of government to come forward and lock up who they please without being tried? In our not too distant past, Americans named Ozaki or Ichiro or Yuki were indefinitely detained by the tens of thousands without trial, without accusation. Will America only begin to regret our loss of trial by jury when the people have names like Smith and Jones? But mark your words, this is about people named Smith and Jones or people named David or Saul or Isaac or Ahmed or Ibrahim. This is about all Americans and whether or not you will have due process, whether or not you will have the protections of the law. We are told that these people are so evil and so dangerous that we can't allow trials. But trial by jury is who we are. Trial by jury is that shining beacon on a hill that people around the world wish to emulate. It's why people came here. It's why we are exceptional as a people. It isn't the color of our skin. It's our ideas. It's the right to trial by jury that is looked to as a beacon of hope for people around the world around the world and we're willing to discard it out of fear. It's a shame to scrap the very rights that make us exceptional as a people. Proponents of indefinite detention will argue that we are a good people and that we will never unjustly detain people. I don't dispute their intentions or impute bad motives to them, but what I will say is remember what Madison said. Madison said that if a government were comprised of angels, we wouldn't need the chains of the Constitution. We wouldn't need to bind your representatives and restrain them from doing bad things to good people. If men were angels, if all men in government were angels, we wouldn't need these rules. But all men in government aren't angels now and never will be. And there is always the danger that someday someone will be elected who would take the rights away of the Japanese. It happened once. Who would take the rights away of Jews or the rights away of Arabs. We are told by these people who believe in indefinite detention that the battle is everywhere. Now if the battle is everywhere, your liberties are nowhere. If the battle is without end, when will they return your liberties? When will your rights be restored if the battle has no end and the battlefield is limitless and the war is endless? When will your rights be restored? It is not a temporary or limited suspension of your right to trial by jury, but an unlimited, unbounded relinquishment of the right to trial by jury without length or duration. We are told that limiting the right to trial by jury is justified under the law of war. 
Am I the only one uncomfortable applying the law of war to American citizens accused of crimes in the United States? Is the law of war a euphemism for martial law? What is the law of war except for something to go around the Constitution? It's an extraordinary circumstance that might happen in a battlefield somewhere else, but should not happen in the United States. Every American accused of a crime, no matter how heinous, should get their day in court, should get a trial by a jury of their peers. These are not idle questions. I believe the defense of the Bill of Rights trumps the concerns for speedy passage, even of a bill, which I generally support. Sixty-seven senators voted just a few weeks ago to include a provision in this bill that says you have a right to trial by jury. And it was plucked out in secret, in conference, despite the wishes of two-thirds of the senators in this body, Republican and Democrat, who were concerned about protecting the right to a jury trial. Many senators say, oh, well, we tried, we lost, they outmaneuvered us, they were sneakier than we were. I disagree, though, that we give up. I think the time is now. I think we make a statement. The fight is today. The subject is too dear. If a majority were today to stand up and say, you know what, the right to trial by jury is important enough to, de to delay the defense authorization bill for two weeks, I think it would be an important message to send. So today I stand and urge a no vote on what I consider to be a travesty of justice. Thank you, Mr. President. The Senator from Michigan. Um, the Senator from Kentucky is <clears throat> flat out wrong. There is no such language in this bill which denies the right to trial by jury. Made the same kind of charges against last year's bill and we're trying to keep up with the false charges that he makes and so we put language in this year's bill saying nothing in last year's bill does and can be implied to do any such thing as the senator from Kentucky is charging. So we have language in this year's bill, nothing in last year's bill, that was the same charge he made against last year's bill, shall be construed to deny the availability of the writ of habeas corpus or deny any constitutional rights in a court ordained or established by under Article Three of the Constitution to any person inside the United States. And then he makes, I think, a totally outlandish charge, which is that, well, okay, so we were outmaneuvered and they were sneakier than we were. Where does that come from? Where did, what's the basis for that kind of a charge against Senator McCain and myself? We have put language in this bill which makes it absolutely clear that nothing that we have adopted here in this Senate does anything like the Senator from Kentucky says, denying people the right to jury trial. So I totally reject his argument. He does not quote any language in this bill that does what he says this bill does. He, he actually started, the senator from Kentucky actually started his statement by saying this bill has language which will deny the trial by jury. What language? What page? Makes the allegation and just sort of leaves it sit there. Well, it's flat out wrong. I yield the floor. Senator from South Carolina. Thank you. Uh, one, I want to congratulate uh, the authors and the managers of the bill in the House for coming up with, I think, a very good bill for our military. Pay raises, uh, trying to increase defenses, and uh, I don't mind saying I think we're at war. I know uh, the presiding officer believes that. Uh, how long does the war last? I don't know. I can't tell you. Uh, am I supposed to know that? Can we not fight it unless we know the date it ends? Uh, America, is it part of the battlefield? You tell me. Where do you think they want to hit us the most? What do you think Al-Qaeda would love to do more than anything else? Come here and destroy the building I'm speaking in. And the only reason they can't get here yet is because we're fighting them over there. We're gathering good intelligence. We're taking the war to them. Our intelligence uh, agencies, our FBI, our military, our CIA, they're all over the world tracking these crazy people so they can't get here. 
So to suggest that I can't tell you when the war ends, therefore we got to turn it into a crime, is dangerous and absurd. Did they know when Germany was going to fall? Berlin? Did they know when Tokyo was going to fall? What happened to the German saboteurs who landed in Long Island during World War II? They were captured by the FBI and turned over to the military. What happened to the American citizens that were helping the German saboteurs? They were held as enemy combatants. To my good friend from Kentucky, I don't doubt your passion. I don't doubt your sincerity. I doubt your judgment on these issues. The Supreme Court has spoken three different times. A recently, just less than a, uh, six or seven years ago, an American citizen was caught helping the Taliban in Afghanistan, and they said, you could hold one of our own as an enemy combatant until the hostilities cease, and that is a hard uh, time to figure. Well, let's get this right. If an American citizen helping the Taliban in Afghanistan kill our soldiers can be captured and held as an enemy combatant, according to the Supreme Court, what kind of world will we live in if the Al-Qaeda collaborator American citizen attacked us here trying to kill us on our own homeland to say, well, that doesn't count. You're no longer at war because we're here in America. That you've got to read them their rights and give them a lawyer and you can't hold them for military intelligence gathering purposes. My good friend doesn't understand that in fighting a war, the goal is to win the war is to defeat the enemy. In fighting a crime, it's designed to hold somebody accountable for a legal wrong. I've been a military lawyer for 30 years. He may not understand the law of war, but I do. And the Supreme Court does. And the Supreme Court has said, in World War II and in this war, if an American citizen collaborates with the enemy, they will be given due process as a, under the law of war. A federal judge will hear the claim, I am wrongly held. I am not part of Al-Qaeda or the Taliban. And that's the only time you can be held as an enemy combatant. You have to be helping Al-Qaeda or the Taliban. You have to be involved in a plot or an act. If the federal judge agrees with the government, yes, you are in fact. There is evidence to suggest you're helping the Taliban or Al-Qaeda. I think most Americans would say, it's reasonable to hold that person to find out what they know about this attack and future attacks. Can you imagine what would happen in this country if three people were running up the Capitol steps to blow up the Capitol, one of them survived, one of them was an American citizen? We could hold them and question them. Where did you train? Is there any other attack planned? What do you know? Who did you work with? That we'd have to say within hours or a day or two, here's your lawyer, you've got a right to remain silent. Can you imagine what would have happened in World War II if the American citizens who helped the Nazis, we turned that into a common crime? The difference between me and the senator from Kentucky is that I believe with all my heart and soul that the Al-Qaeda Taliban groups <clears throat> are at war with us and are trying to come to our homeland. And I know they're trying to find American citizens to help them, and they will. There's never been a war in America where somebody within the American citizen community did not collaborate with the enemy. That is happening today. And when that day comes and we capture that person, I want as an option the ability to hold them as an enemy combatant like we have in other wars. They will get their day in court, but they will not be read their rights or given a lawyer on the spot because that would stop intelligence gathering. So to the managers of this bill, to the men and women in the House who send it over here, thank God that you chose a balance between due process and common sense. And all I will say is that the way we found bin Laden was not through torture. And I'm offended by that, as Senator McCain and Senator Levin. The way we tracked down bin Laden is that we had people held at Gitmo for years under the law of war. We don't try you or let you go. 
When you capture somebody on the battlefield, you don't hold a trial, you hold the prisoner to try to gather intelligence and keep them off the battlefield. And through that process, over years, the Bush administration and the Obama administration put together the puzzle about bin Laden. It wasn't because of waterboarding. It's because this country had available to it the law of war detention that would allow us to hold people and get to know them over time and make sure they could not go back to the fight. And good questioning and good interrogation techniques led to finding bin Laden. What the senator from Kentucky is saying, that would not be available to us as a nation if an American citizen were involved attacking us on the homeland. What an absurd result. Absurd result. That if an American citizen joined with al-Qaeda to kill everybody in this room, for some unknown reason, we would turn that into a crime rather than an act of war. If you collaborate with al-Qaeda or the Taliban, two things can happen to you. You can get killed, you can get captured. And you will get a trial one day, most likely, and nobody's restricting your trial rights. What Senator Levin said is true. There's nothing in here restricting the right of trial. What's in here is giving us the option to hold someone as an enemy combatant so you don't have to Mirandize them and turn an turn act of war into a crime. And it won't be long, I'm afraid, before this theory is tested in reality. The enemy is afoot. They're trying to penetrate our homeland. They're seeking aid and comfort from Americans within our own country who are going to side with the enemy, unfortunately. And when that day comes, I want to make sure that we have the ability in this war, like every other war, to hold them, to gather intelligence, not to torture them, but to make sure that we're safe as a nation. Due process, yes. Under the law of war, it must be so. If we turn this war into a crime, we're going to regret it. And if you don't believe we're at war, then I just could not disagree with you more. And I cannot tell you when the war ends, but I will tell you how it ends. This is how it's going to end. We're going to win, and they're going to lose, because we can't afford to lose. And between now and when that day comes, we're going to take the fight to you. If we find an American citizen helping the enemy overseas, this president ordered the killing by drone of uh, Alakwi, an American citizen overseas, I believe it was Yemen, and the president said, I have ample evidence he is now assisting al-Qaeda overseas to attack American targets. I'm going to take him out. Well done, Mr. President. Well done, Mr. President. Now, if we all, most of us agree, you can kill an American citizen helping al-Qaeda kill us overseas. You can't capture an American citizen helping al-Qaeda here at home and hold them for questioning under the law of war? What an absurd result. So I not only am going to vote for this bill, I'm going to celebrate the fact that we've done nothing to stop a trial right. As Senator Levin said, there's not one thing in this bill restricts your right to a trial. What we do have in this bill is the recognition we're at war and we retain as an option that has not been used. There is no American citizen in low war detention, but there may be a need for that one day and we retain that right under this bill. So, gentlemen, gentlemen, yield for a question very sure. briefly. So under the scenario as envisioned by the argument of the senator from Kentucky <clears throat> that if an American citizen is overseas as Alawaki was in Yemen, and we took a drone and killed, killed it, which was a decision made by the President of the United States. Good decision. Mr. But if Mr. Alawaki had been in the United States of America, a citizen engaged in the same activities which Against justified him being killed, that Mr. Alawaki would have been entitled, entitled to his Miranda rights, uh, a trial by jury, habeas corpus, all of the, as if he were treated as an American citizen. Uh, I don't think many people would quite understand uh, that distinction of geography. Well, it makes no sense, Senator McCain, and he would be entitled to a habeas hearing if he were caught here in the United States, but he would be held under the law of war because the allegation against him is not that he committed a crime, that he's collaborating with the enemy. So yes, you could have a scenario 
under the senator from Kentucky's uh, view of things, that we could kill somebody, an American citizen overseas helping the enemy kill our troops, but if they made it here at home or joined with al-Qaeda here at home, all of a sudden we've got to give them a law and read them their rights and we can't hold them for uh, under law of war detention to find out what they know about an impending attack. That makes absolutely no sense. The Supreme Court has rejected that kind of thinking. So uh, I hope that day never comes, but I can tell you this. I don't know when the war is over. He's right about that, but I know this. As long as I'm in the Senate, we're going to fight it. And we're going to fight it as a war, not a crime. Uh, gentlemen, we yield back. I, from every indication in the, in the Middle East uh, that we see and around the world, Al-Qaeda is on the way back, far from being defeated. And I just want to make an additional comment to my friend, uh, Senator Levin, the chairman who I've had the honor of bringing these bills to the floor with and working together with a... Uh, for 25 years, and I was tempted to leave it unresponded to, but a statement that the Center from Kentucky made, well, they were sneakier than we were. Um, uh, I, I just have to say to the chairman, I, I don't think that you have ever conducted our committee and our deliberations and our work here on the floor and in conference uh, in any way as being uh, sneaky. So. Uh, I, I, I categorically reject uh, that kind of comment, and uh, I don't think it's worthy of, your, of the performance that you have provided to this committee. I very much thank uh, my dear friend from Arizona. Senator from Michigan. Uh, and I, I thank Presiding Officer. I, I, only one thing I'll add to this subject before I know the Senator from Arkansas seeks to speak, and we're going to run out of time soon, is that um, the provision which was in our bill, which uh, both the ranking member and myself voted for, which was stricken. Uh, one of the arguments against it was made by the ACLU. So when our friend from Kentucky talks about something in this bill which denies the right to jury trial, and the proof that he gives for that is something that's not in the bill, which is, violates logic to begin with. But putting that aside, one of the arguments against keeping it in the bill was made by the American Civil Liberties Union and surely they believe that people's rights to trial and jury trial should not be denied. So uh, the allegations that were made by the senator from Kentucky are wrong. There is absolutely no substantiation for them, including the one which was just uh, referred to by uh, Senator McCain. But the, 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 the statement that he makes, that there's language in this bill, here's the bill. Where's the senator? from Kentucky. What page of the bill is he referring to? The language that he says denies people the right to trial. It's uh, just simply not there, and uh, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Arkansas. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm going to try to keep my remarks to about five minutes here. Uh, I would first, though, like to thank Senators Levin and McCain for their leadership on this legislation. They really set the tone and they've been good role models for the entire Senate on how legislation should be conducted. So I want to thank both of them. I think many of my colleagues feel the very same way that we appreciate how they've handled the National Defense Authorization. It's been a massive undertaking and sometimes as we know uh, we have a lot of gridlock around here but because of the way they've handled it they've been able to get this bill to this point. Mr. Pre Mr. President, I'm not going to object to the, this bill at all. At one point, I thought about it because I am so upset. In fact, uh, my staff has even said livid, and I have been livid, about how one item has been handled by the Air Force here. And that is, uh, as we all know, about 10 months ago, the Air Force came out with a proposed force restructure, and that included taking an A-10 unit away from the Arkansas Air National Guard that's based in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Well, understandably, when something like that happens, you have questions. So 10 months ago, I started asking, why are you doing this? Give me your analysis. Give me the, the, how much money are you going to save? Um, are you aware that, that you have Fort Chaffee right off the end of the runway? I want to talk about that in just a minute. Are you aware that this just went through a BRAC? 
that they had F-16s there, now they have A-10s, and the BRAC Commission has gone through this process, and they said this is the best place you can have A-10s, right here in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And so we basically got stonewalled. They never gave us any analysis, wouldn't tell us any of their numbers, wouldn't tell us how much this is costing, how much this is saving. They, they just absolutely stonewalled, not just my office, but they stonewalled the whole Congress, as far as I know. I mean, I've talked to people all over this place, on the Senate side and the House side, they never got any numbers. Finally, just in the last few weeks, in talking to members of the Air Force that have stars on their shoulders, they've told me, well, there was no business analysis. There was no base-by-base -base, uh, analysis here. Basically, what this boils down to is we need to make some cuts, and, you know, more or less your number came up. And they go back to the one flying mission per state, we can talk about that uh, more if we want to. But the problem is we are in a budget environment where we're having downward pressure on military spending. We know that. We're going to have to make military cuts, not just this year, but in the out years. There's no doubt about it. The United States Air Force should always count the cost. They should always make a determination on how much these things cost, how much they save. They didn't do that here. They should also know that we're going to have a smaller force in the future. So as we uh, wean out some units, and it's going to happen, it's going to be painful, people aren't going to like it, but you should keep the best units you have, the strongest units you have. And the 188th in Fort Smith, Arkansas is the best unit in the system. And I say that objectively because there are numbers to back that up. It's the cheapest to, op to operate, even though it went through the uh, transition from F-16s to A-10s just a few years ago, they've already deployed twice. They've deployed twice. One reason they got extended in a deployment was because another A-10 unit wasn't ready. And what this does is this puts those pilots, those men and women in uniform, who just got back from Afghanistan, they get off the plane, they're being hu hugged by their spouses and their children and their community, and basically the Air Force is giving them a pink slip. Now the ultimate slap in the face happened just this week when the National Guard Bureau had the audacity to contact the 188th Flying Wing in Fort Smith and say, hey, by the way, could you deploy one more time? There's another unit that's not ready. Can you deploy one more time? It's just astonishing that the Air Force would do this. But we had a commission in there. The commission didn't survive. I think, you know, we've, I've talked about that with several of my colleagues that are on the conference. Even though this wing has had more nautical miles of military training than any other unit in the Air National Guard, even though it's closer to proximity to its flying range, its bombing range, than any other unit, it's the best setup in all of North America to have the 188th, where it is located in Fort Smith and in Fort Chaffee, which is the Army National Guard basically their national training center right there. They love to train with A-10s. We're talking about close air support vehicles here. I don't think the Air Force took that in consideration for one minute. I, make, I think they made an arbitrary decision here. I don't think it's in our national interest. I don't think it's in uh, the interest of our national security. And I'm just putting people on notice that this fight isn't over. I understand about the downward pressure. I get all that stuff, but this fight is not over, but I'm not going to object to this bill today. I am going to vote for its passage, and again, I want to thank the chairman and the ranking member for their great leadership on this. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President.